So today um, in our series on unpacking presence, I wanted to um, just talk a little bit about um, a polarity in practice that often arises, um, which is what does it mean to practice in stillness? And what does it mean to be present in motion? Um, and why is it that these two often seem to be opposed to one another? Uh, you know, in, in Buddhist meditation, as an example, in most of the Buddhist traditions that I've been exposed to, there is a strong preference for stillness in the meditation. Now, there is also an emphasis often on walking meditation. Uh, and so in some traditions, they have certain kinds of yogas or, or, or a ways of moving the body to help uh, integration, embodiment. Um, but it's, it's, I'd say overall, it's a vastly... Uh, the, the Buddhist tradition is, is very interested in stillness. Uh, and um, that's, I think, a lot of what, what drew me to the, to, to the Buddhist tradition is I, I also have a preference for stillness. And, and what is that preference about? Um, well, uh, Franz Kafka has a beautiful uh, way of putting it here. He says, you need not leave your room. Remain sitting at your table and listen. You need not even listen. Simply wait, just learn to become quiet and still and solitary. The world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Um, and what I love about that quote for me is it, it points to this path of I would call it the wit witnessing awareness you know, of being able to just sit, listen, be okay being alone in that presence, and then to watch as everything, as the world that we're aware of starts to um, become illuminated through our presence with it. And because in stillness there's, there's non-movement, there's also the potential for non-reactivity. Um, there's the potential to be present with everything that's arising and to be unmoved by the display, to, uh, to not be knocked out of that witnessing awareness, that present awareness. And when that happens, my experience is that that, that deep sense of formless presence, which can be aware of everything that's arising and passing, um, that that's something we can rest in, something we can um, abide in. And it's a really beautiful thing because it, it often does lead to this experience of, uh, of experience of life, the world being unmasked and rolling in ecstasy at our feet. Of course, sometimes it's the opposite of that too. But, but the good news is when you're silent and still and witnessing even when everything is dying and falling apart, there's still there's some part of you that you're touched into, tapped into, that is undying, that is unborn, uh, that isn't influenced by the arising and passing of, of, of phenomena, and 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 that there's a certain kind of deep freedom in that uh, in that position, uh, but that isn't the only position that's possible. Uh, and, if, and in fact, I think there's a lot of harm that comes from preferencing stillness and witnessing. And, and this is the story of my own practice. You know, it's um, really a story of 10 years of trying to abide uh, in this sort of transcendent super space of awareness, uh, in part because I love the freedom of it and also because I want to avoid the pain of being human. Um, and what I found in that freedom is that the freedom is not separate from the fullness of what's arising, actually. Um, that when, when everything is emptied out, uh, then actually there is no awareness apart from what's being experienced. There isn't some space or place that I can abide in that's separate from what's arising. And to, to me, that realization of what's often called non-duality drew me back into the world of form and movement and space and emotion and psychology in a way that um, I'm really grateful for, but also is really fucking painful. Um, um, 
and, and the, the practice that I want to share with you today, um, I think of it as spontaneous movement. Um, I think um, it also could be called authentic movement. Uh, there's probably a lots of names for this. This is one of my favorite books describing something like what we're going to do um, by Mary Stark Whitehouse, who is a dancer and teacher. And um, she describes something really similar from the dance perspective of what happens when you learn how to tune into and abide in your body and start to um, uh, learn how to let the body move you um, uh, as opposed to you moving it. Uh, and here I wanted to share a quote um, from Mary in an essay called The Tao of the Body about movement. And she says here that movement is the great law of life. Everything moves. The heavens move. The earth turns. The great tides mount the beaches of the world. The, great, the clouds march slowly across the sky, driven by wind that stirs the trees into a dance of branches. Water, rising in the mountain springs, runs down the slopes to join the current of the river. Fire, begun in the brush, leaps, roaring over the ground and the earth, so slow, so always there, grumbles and groans and shifts in the sleep of centuries. So too, all living creatures, birds and fish and insects, animals, snakes and snails, have their being in movement, exist by virtue of it, show forth their nature through it, in the words of the old song, fish got to swim, birds got to fly. And man, whoever he is, wherever he is, he too lives in movement. His body is a world of movement in itself. Breathing and circulation, digestion and reproduction are all unconscious movement processes, the wonderful motor patterns of his life. Within this pattern, she lies down, she sits, she stands, and standing, walks, and runs. She sleeps, eats, copulates, fights, weeps, laughs, and talks. Um, and I think that last part is really insightful, and, and talks. It's like, oh yeah, speech is a form of movement. Uh, literally, physically, a, a type of movement of air through our, uh, through our bodies that's uh, manipulated, embodied manipulation, movement of air. And then it's the movement of ideas. Um, and so uh, I, I just thought that was such a beautiful way of putting how central movement is to life. Uh, everything is movement. So, so here we have really two dimensions of life stillness and movement and and i would say these correspond roughly within the buddhist tradition is called emptiness and form you know that there is this sort of recognition of the uh the non graspable nature of life that we can't actually put it into a form uh, and say this is it uh or put it into a word or put it into an idea or anything it's not capturable it, it, it is beyond form and thus it's formless um, and yet there is always this constant arising of form. If, if we're aware, we're alive, there's form, there's movement. Um, so um, this movement and stillness. Um, I wanted to, the last thing I wanted to say is just that I, I've noticed that uh, meditators, as meditators, we have a preference usually for one of these sides, uh, sometimes for stillness, sometimes for movement. Um, a, a lot of people that I've worked with um, tend to be like me and they tend to prefer stillness or formlessness. And then a lot of the challenge and practice is, well, how do you learn how to move? Uh, how can you maintain that presence while in motion? Because the, the challenge, if you're attached to stillness, uh, is that motion and movement is seen as a distraction. You know, it's like something that potentially can knock you out of presence. 
And, um, and that becomes like a battle, right? Again, it's like, oh, well, no, like I have to be in this position or I have to be in this posture in order to be present in order to be free or my, the conditions around me have to be such you know, um, you can imagine most of the monastic environments, you know, that are, they're really trying to create a condition environment of like stillness and maximum, you know, quietude. Uh, I remember doing long retreats in the, in the central Massachusetts at the forest refuge, this long-term retreat facility. And it's literally got in the forest, nothing around. And it literally has cork floors, which it absorbs sound. <laughs> and so you're in this spectacularly refined environment you know that's all everything is geared towards stillness um, but then when you leave the retreat and you go back to the madness of boston airport you know logan airport uh it's like a uh, as one as one person said in a recent group it's like a reverse culture shock you know where you're kind of coming back in and you're like oh my god because we live in a culture where there is so much movement and so much intensity and i think maybe that's why we seek stillness too um, but we have to learn, again, how to integrate these two poles in our own practice. That way we're not disrupted by, um, by distractions because distractions are movements um, that we don't like. <laughs> uh, but if we can allow everything to be what it is uh, in, its fo- in its moving form uh, and we can rest in this, this formless awareness that isn't moved somehow by all the movement, uh, then, you know, th- then there's nothing that can distract us actually in practice in those moments where we get the non-duality of movement and stillness.